Hi, hey everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. So uh, just hang tight and we'll be with you in a moment. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get uh, ready to go this afternoon. Hi everyone, uh, again, for some of you. Uh, my name is Michael Ibrahim. I am program manager with the cultural investment portfolio here at the Mass Cultural Council. Our focus is on grants and services for nonprofit organizations. And we are excited to deliver our workshop for you today, Nonprofit Unemployment Obligations. Uh, this workshop is part of our recover, rebuild, and renew efforts to help organizations come back from COVID-19. This spring, we are offering two free workshops every Tuesday and every Thursday in the areas of financial management, legal issues, human resources, advocacy, management, and board governance. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, uh, feel free to introduce your name, organization, title, if you like, in our chat, just so we know, everybody knows who's here. Um, joining us today are Luke Blackadar from the Arts and Business Council of Greater Boston and Jill Havens from the Law Office of Jill Havens. Uh, while they're gonna introduce themselves in just a moment, I have a few ground rules before we get going. As you probably noticed already, we have live captioning here today. Uh, these auto-generated caption, captions are available on all Mass Cultural Council Zoom meetings and webinars. If you do need additional accommodations to ensure your participation for future webinars, just let us know when you register. Uh, if this is distracting for you, you can hide this by clicking hide subtitles in the closed captioning option at the bottom of Zoom. We're gonna have time for plenty of questions and answers about this topic and some other legal uh, questions you might have uh, about, about this topic. So feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom. We try to keep everything on the Q&A and not in the chat just because it helps us keep these organized and Jill and Luke will be answering your questions throughout the session. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel when it's ready. If you come to our sessions, you know we send you an email right after as soon as it's available. Some folks uh, that would really benefit from this content may not be available during the day to, uh, to take this in. So this might be something that you wanna to share to an HR person or someone on your board or, or someone who handles uh, the unemployment side of your organization. So it will be available afterwards, including the presentation. My colleague, Sarah Glidden is here and Sarah is providing some resources, as we just see right now in the chat, uh, just to make Make sure that you know what's uh, what's going on and how to access additional resources. Uh, tomorrow, when we send you the email about the recording, you'll get the presentation and any other additional materials that uh, that Luke and Jill want to share. We are we are scheduled for 90 minutes. We may go a little less than that, depending on our questions. Uh, but we want to make sure we have enough time to help you out with that. And with that, I'd like to tur turn it over to Luke and Jill. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having us. Hey everyone, my name is Luke Blackadar. I'm the director of the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. And yeah, so this presentation is to talk about unemployment obligations for nonprofit employers. One of the things we've seen, you know, in light of the pandemic is a lot of um, artists, you know, seeking assistance with applying for unemployment. Um, and we're very fortunate today to have Jill Havens from the law office of Jill Havens, who is a, a veteran labor employment attorney um, representing particularly employees um, and, you know, has a ton of knowledge on um, unemployment and the process. So we're going to talk about some of the issues that um, nonprofit uh, organizations deal with on employer side and also some of the issues that employees see that ripple and can affect the employers. So. Um, we've worked with Jill a number of times. I um, will plug her and um, the interview. She's done a series of interviews with us last summer when the pandemic was at its apex. And um, she and her colleague, Elizabeth Mason, um, gave us a lot of valuable information about um, 
unemployment basics, you know, what the procedure looks like generally, particularly for employees, and, you know, what to do when PO, um, pandemic unemployment assistance rolled out. Um, so I can't plug those, those resources enough. I believe they're on our website, artsandbusinesscouncil.org forward slash COVID-19. Um, so definitely check those out if, um, you know, if you have employees who have questions about the unemployment process, pandemic unemployment process, um, and just as kind of uh, another part of this conversation. But um, I don't, I don't want to hog up all the bandwidth. So uh, Jill, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Um, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I think Luke kind of covered it. I, my name is Jill Havens, and I have a um, solo small law firm, the law office of Jill Havens. Not very creative in my my titling, I guess. Uh, and I handle um, employment law cases, in, and I represent only employees. So I do wage and hour and discrimination cases. And I also do a lot of unemployment cases. And since the pandemic, I've been doing 90%, I think, unemployment cases. And um, this will come up as we go along, but I do not really know much about the employer side of things. So you know, how you fix problems, things like that. Um, I don't know, you know, Luke has done some research on it, but I can give some insight into how things work in general and how you can structure things to help employees and, and um, some pieces like that, which is what we're gonna cover. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so generally the overall discussion we're gonna have is, you know, one, what are the employees who are subject to the unemployment uh, contribution requirement generally? Um, what is, um, what types of employment are exempt, mainly independent contractors, which we'll get into, um, how and when to contribute, you know, what does that process actually look like? Um, what do I have to do? Where do I have to go as a, a employer of employees? And most of this is going to be um, Jill and I talking about some common kind of challenging UI issues that um, I, I've definitely seen uh, in my practice at the Arts and Business Council. And I'm sure Jill has seen um, in her, you know, her, her private practice and even more so now that, you know, like you said, 90% of her practice is doing uh, unemployment. So just some of the more sticky issues, um, you know, what do I do when I have an employee who is still working for me, but, you know, I receive a, an unemployment claim that they didn't file, et cetera. You know, some of these um, kind of uh, frustrating issues and, and challenges that are very common now. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of these generally. Um, we do invite questions, you know, Michael and I will be keeping track of the questions as they roll in, if you have any, or you know, specific anecdotes or, or other things. Um, but I would also recommend taking a look at the workshop we did, I think last week with Danielle Jerema from um, Morgan Brown and Joy on uh, just employment law fundamentals to start with, you know, what is an employee? What is an employer? What does that relationship look like? What is the difference between that and an independent contractor, et cetera? So um, definitely would re recommend that as kind of a, a 101 for this as well. Um, so first, you know, who has to contribute? Generally, if you're a private for-profit employer, and this does actually include uh, nonprofits as well, uh, within the Commonwealth, then the Massachusetts statute requires you to contribute to an unemployment insurance trust fund, um, provided that your business meets these one, uh, one or both of these following conditions. Um, one, you have one or more employees working on a permanent, uh, temporary, or part-time basis on at least one or more days in each of the 13 week, each of 13 weeks during the calendar year, or you pay wages of over $1,500 in any calendar quarter. Um, and again, while they specify that this uh, is for private for-profit enterprises, it does also include nonprofit employers. If, if you are a nonprofit organization and you uh, also, you have employees, W-2 earning employees, then you are also um, obligated to pay into um, the unemployment system. Um, Jill, are there any other criteria for, or any other weird minutia about that or? I don't think so. Um, nonprofits, I believe, have an option to be self-insured, self mm. so this is unemployment insurance. Uh, and I think you only get like once a year where you can opt to change that. I know a lot of nonprofits learned their lessons on that back 10 years ago in the last 
um, recession, that that wasn't necessarily a good idea to be on the hook for 100% of the unemployment payments. But um, if you have chosen that, you still have to, um, you don't pay in, but you are self-insured in the sense mm -hmm. that if somebody files an unemployment claim, you have to pay it all out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what is exempt? There are a couple other categories of exemption that I, I don't think are going to be particularly relevant for um, this constituency. You know, you know, one is um, religious, certain religious um, uh, employees within religious organizations are exempt, but um, most commonly you'll probably be dealing with independent contractors. You, you are mostly, you're probably going to have a mix of um, W-2 employees, your staff who are running your programs, and then you might have, you know, consultants or, or advisors or other um, constituents within your community who you, you know, pay on an independent contractor basis. And this was something that we talked a little bit about in the last workshop, um, about you know what it what constitutes an independent contractor, Massachusetts is fairly pro employee and willing to find more likely to find an employee uh, employee employer relationship. Um, so you do have to be mindful of you know how are you classifying your workers. Um, it's not a choice that you get to make. It is a choice that it is decided by the law and the circumstances of your your hiring and your staff. Um, but generally you as an employer are not obligated to contribute to unemployment insurance for independent contractors, as long as they are actually independent contractors, meaning they're free from your control in the performance of the services they provide for you. Um, the service that they're providing is typically, is, is outside your usual course of business. And also the work that that person is doing is traditionally the type of work that would be fulfilled by an independent contractor. You know independently uh, established trade or, or things like that. Um, so you do have to, you know, your workers do have to fulfill all three of these criteria in order for them to be independent contractors. And this is a question we'll get to in a little bit, you know, can I convert my employees from uh, W2 to 1099, vice versa? Um, but for the, you generally are not going to be able to have discretion to make that decision. It's going to be decided by the facts and the circumstances of your employees and your workers employment um, and the, you know, Massachusetts law. Um, so, but generally know that for independent contractors, um, you will not usually be contributing into unemployment insurance for that. Um, and I, I mentioned this because we did have pandemic unemployment, which did extend unemployment benefits to um, self-employed individuals, independent contractors, people who traditionally um, would be overlooked by the unemployment system. So just know that you are not contributing to that pool. Um, so how do you can, oh, yeah. can I Can I just, just a couple of little comments. Yeah, the, the pandemic unemployment assistance, which people think of mostly for the gig workers, independent contractors, self-employed is still going on. And the, basically the federal government's paying for that. You don't pay into yeah. it, but just a, it's almost nobody in Massachusetts is actually an independent contractor if they're doing work. It's really hard. These are ands, so this person has to be yeah. all of these things. And there are not only penalties if you do this wrong, you know, if you're like, you know, it's gonna be cheaper for us, let's do a 1099 instead. Penalties for unemployment if you do it wrong. Um, you have you get penalties from the federal, from the IRS if you're doing it wrong. Uh, you can be sued by your employees if you're doing it wrong. And worse, if somebody gets hurt on the job and you do not have paying workers comp for them and you were supposed to be because they're supposed to be a regular employee, you can be in very deep financial trouble for that. You can get sued for lots and lots and lots of money with almost no defense for it. So that alone, I always tell people, scares them into <laughs> don't try to get away with this. Um, it will, um, it could really, really hurt your, your business. Yeah. And, and, Another another good point on that is you will have circumstances where you know both you and the worker you know you you have this agreement you know either verbally or orally or or in writing that oh yeah no I I I want to be an independent contractor I don't want to be an employee either to Jill's point it doesn't matter it like if you fulfill these criteria all three of them and you know as Jill said for many employees and many workers you will. Um, that's really the end of the discussion. That is the end of the analysis. Um, so 
it, it doesn't, even if you guys both try to contract around it, this is one of those circumstances where you cannot, you can't simply contract around the Massachusetts employment statute. Um, if the facts demonstrate that you are an employer and you should be um, treating your workers and staff as employees and compensating and, and providing benefits as such, then that's, that's the end of it and that's what you have to do. Um, so we did get a question in the interim. We had an interesting situation where we hired an artist for a two week project under a contract. We mostly hire artists, but don't produce art ourselves. We then got an unemployment claim from the state that appeared to be holding us to that person. Um, given that it's so hard in Massachusetts to claim people aren't employees, are most companies likely liable in situations like this? So, so follow, I think I'd have to know more about this question, but you know, is in this circumstance, is, so is the person, did you get an, so was the unemployment claim from out of state as well? Um, and I'll give them a minute to, to, to follow up with that. But um, I know this is a problem that we get pretty Luke, frequently I, too. Luke, I believe that person said, no, it was not out of state. Oh, okay. So mostly hire artists, but we don't produce art ourselves. We then got an employment claim from the state that appeared to be holding us to this person. I mean, I would just say we don't really have enough here. <laughs> look at look at these three pieces, you know, was that yeah. person free from control? I always think of the free control as think of you hired somebody to come in and paint your offices and they had their own little painting business. Maybe it wasn't an incorporated thing. But you know, they're gonna decide, not you, if they should come in on Saturdays or what kind of rollers mm -hmm. are they gonna use and um, you know, whether they bring in a person to help them or not, that's gonna be up to them. That's part of the being free from control. If somebody's an artist and you're telling them what to do, they're not free from control. And yeah, you don't produce art, but you do art. So it's somebody painting your offices is definitely gonna be outside of your business. I mean, an artist come into a place that does arts may not be that case. Yeah, it's it's it sounds like this is a, a fairly straight. It sounds like this is mostly a, a independent contractor versus employee question. It does boil down to those three factors. So yeah, maybe that you don't create art as part of your business. Kind of, it might weigh into one of these these remaining two factors. But it depends on everything else. Like it, it the the touchstone of whether you're an employee versus an employer really is, or, or an independent contractor really is. How much control does the employer exert over the conditions in which you're fulfilling your, your work? Like, are they on your site during your business hours using your resources or are they, you know, they come in on their hours, you know, like Jill said, I decide when I'm, if I'm going to come in on a Saturday, I decide what tools I'm going to use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's ultimately going to determine it. And then for the second part of the question, you know, if that's the case, are the companies likely liable? And, and liable is in to the unemployment office in the sense that you should have been paying in for those people and they will they will let you know that you owe the money because you didn't, then the answer is yes. Yeah. So um, how, how do we contribute and when? So if you are one of these organizations that does fall under the, the requirements to contribute to the unemployment insurance trust, um, then you should be making your payments quarterly. And the Department of Unemployment Assistance strongly recommends you do it by these four deadlines. So quarter one, basically a month after the end of the, the fiscal quarter. So um, for the first quarter, submit by April 30th, second quarter, July 31st, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and failure to pay these on time, failure to pay them on, at all and failure to pay them on time can result in interest. The department will charge you interest at a rate of I think 12%. Um, and they can also issue other penalties. Um, so the rate that you contribute, you know, how much do I actually have to pay into the system? It's, it's set by law, it's set by statute. It's kind of strange. Basically in your first three years that you have been determined to be um, required to contribute to unemployment, um, you're gonna basically be assigned a, a contribution rate by the department. They're gonna decide what you pay um, and then Four years on, you will be, you know, you'll have your your true, your true contribution rate, which is also divided by statute. It's a 
strange formula, um, but we have resources at the end of the presentation that link to um, the Department of Unemployment Insurance's website and uh, Assistance's website and where to find um, all this information about, you know, how much. Um, but just know that you, you do have certain timing requirements that you have to be paying. Um, and the, what, there are a couple ways to do it. You know, you should have, there's a, a form on the Department of Unemployment Assistance website. They have an online portal where you can register your business um, as an employer and manage your unemployment payments through that. Um, I think most commonly, if you do have regular, you know, staff who are earning W-2s, you have employees who you work with, and you're working with a payroll processor like ADP, Paychex, or what have you, um, then most of these commercial payroll processing services, they will cover the unemployment issue. They'll, they'll handle um, making sure that you're withholding whatever you need to from um, the, the wages in order to cover those costs and they'll make sure that, you know, it gets paid on time. So um, the kind of the, the short answer to how to do it is probably get a payroll processor to help you with all the headache of managing it. But alternatively, you can do it online. You have to sign up with the Department of Unemployment Assistance and, um, you know, you will have to just make sure that you are going in regularly to, um, you have to provide a, a wage report and you have to submit the actual con the unemployment contribution. Um, so that's the general nuts and bolts of how to do it. Um, again, there are resources kind of linking to all of this information at the end of the presentation. And the department does have a lot of robust guidance for employers um, who have to work through these issues as well. Um, so now I think I just want to talk about some of the the a lot of the kind of sticky issues that you know we've been dealing with, and I'm sure that Jill has been dealing with. Um, so, I one thing that we we see a little bit more commonly. Um, so, if someone we know that if I lay someone off, then um, you know, it wasn't a turn, it wasn't a firing and they didn't leave for cause. We simply had to, or they didn't leave voluntarily. We had to, we had to terminate them for some reason. Um, I'm relating to, you know, their performance, et cetera. Um, I know that they can be eligible for unemployment insurance. So are there any other type of personnel changes that uh, we can make that can um, enable currently working employees for us to collect unemployment? Uh, yes. Um, if you're talking about reducing hours, yeah. If somebody has their hours reduced and their and their, because it's hours and and money associated, you know, wages reduced, um, then they may be eligible. Uh, it kind of depends on how much. I think the kind of standard guideline guideline is right around two thirds. If you're down mm -hmm. about two thirds, I mean, you're still you're still working. You were making 1200 and now you're making 800 that's mm -hmm. two thirds you, you might be just starting to be eligible then um so if you cut people's pay in half they will be eligible and remember right now right now there's the extra 300 dollars a week from the federal mm -hmm. government and that is going to be continuing for the next six months or so if, assuming that biden signs this tomorrow it was his idea he better be uh the the new plan so the in some ways, if you cut people's wages in half and you pay them half time and they work half time and they can get partial unemployment and get the extra $300, there's cases where that's going to actually come out ahead for them. Um, you know, that math is slightly um, easy to run. So I think that's what you mean. You also, you know, if you fire people, they very well may be eligible for unemployment. And if people quit, they might be eligible for unemployment too. It, it, that depends on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you were looking at what proactively people, uh, yeah. employers could do to, to, to work with people. There's also a system called a, um, I think it's called WorkShare, uh, where it's a, it's a sharing system with the unemployment you have, office. You have to sign up for it. You have to go through a bunch of hoops, but it's a ways that you get more work out of people while paying them less and the unemployment comes out a little bit better for them, the, the employee, like, rather than a couple of half time. 
a little bit better for them and a little bit better for you, but you have to kind of go through some hoops to set that up, but you can find that on the unemployment website. Great. Yeah. And I see that Sarah put that in the chat as well. Um, so, and I know that you deal with this on the employee side, Jill, but um, when an employer receives an unemployment claim um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's proper, they know it, they're aware of it. Um, what do they have to do? And, and do you know what kind of information they have to certify on that or? I actually, I actually don't, but they, you know, it will, it will state on it what they need. They, they need verification that the person worked there. They need verification of their wages over the last four quarters. Um, they'll ask the reason why they're, if they're no longer working there or if they're there part-time, if it's part-time, how many hours now, what's, you know, what date did things change? What date did they, um, you know, leave their job? Um, and the reason, you know, was it, were, were the, was the person laid off? For unemployment purposes, for checking boxes laid off and furloughed is the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it will be asking, asking you that and they may have follow-up questions. It's important if you really want to help your employees that you do respond to those pretty quickly. Because if the unemployment has, office has to chase you down to respond, that employee who you just laid off and thinking that they were going to be helped is going to be sit not collecting any benefits while they're waiting for you to respond. So you may, employers, well, I didn't get around to it. It's been two months. But there was, that was eight weeks that that person was not collecting any money while they were waiting for you to respond. So please, please do it quickly. It will help them. Yeah. So when you get those, when you get those claims, respond timely, respond quickly. Um, you know, it, that it will, it will benefit, it will only benefit your employee. Um, so if, you know, if you've had an employee who has, you know, you've, you've had to lay them off, they are, they do have a, a pending unemployment claim you've certified it and all that stuff, but now you know that they, you know, their claim was denied. Um, and you have been, you know, that the, the employee is going to have a, you know, a hearing to appeal that decision of the employment office. Um, do I, as an employer, have to participate in that all, at all? Should I participate in it? Is, is that something that I, that, for, that I should do that will help or will I cause more problems? What do I do with that? So in that situation where somebody was laid off, but for some if they got denied, for that would mean for some reason the unemployment office didn't believe it was really a layoff, maybe. Um, then, yeah, though, if they, they appeal and they get a hearing, the employer will be invited to the hearing. Um, you do not need to show up. You can, they can go forward without you. If you think you could be helpful, if you think, oh, yeah, this person should definitely be getting unemployment, you know, they were laid off. I don't understand what went wrong. I can help. Well, then you can show up and try to be helpful. Or you can also reach out to your former employee and say, how come you have a hearing? How can I help? Can I write a letter? Can I show up and testify? Um, there's no reason why you can't talk ahead of time and, and decide how you um, can be helped. And if it's like, you know, I, we just want to stay out of this, then just, you don't, you don't need to go. Make it simpler. So I guess a follow-up to that is, are there, are there reasons, are there potential reasons that the unemployment office might deny a claim that is, you know, it, it's not, because there was a total, you know, difference of, you know, reporting. Is there a reason that the office might deny an unemployment claim that is something that could be resolved by just like, you know, working with the, like, just like talking to the employer? Are there like kind of, you know, routine, almost logistical, like admin reasons why like, you know, an employer accidentally certified the wrong thing or the employer was like, well, it was a furlough, not a layoff or, or something like that. Um, that was just kind well, of, you know, yeah, go ahead. Well, unfortunately, the unemployment system is very archaic and half broken and, and was not great before the pandemic. And now, you know, their, their volume went up, you know, 20 fold a year ago. So theoretically, that would be nice if there was a way if it could be like, oh, we'll make a phone call and we'll be able to fix this administrative thing. Most of the time, no. Once something is, they've been, they denied somebody, and they have to appeal and get a hearing and it's only and they have to wait to the hearing to fix things. Occasionally, um, occasionally you might be able to, to help dig into there, but usually, usually not. Not that it on paper couldn't work that way. It's just they're not, 
they're not really set up. But somebody can be denied for all kinds of things that can go wrong. They could think that they were, um, you know, that they were still working there or, or, or think that the, the timing was wrong or, you know, things that are just, uh, they, unemployment office makes lots of mistakes too, so. <laughs> Um, we do have another question, and this is one I, I think I've I've asked you a dozen times, Jill. A dozen times, Jill. Um, if an employee is based in another state, whose unemployment insurance do they fall under? Parens, we're in Massachusetts, but say we hired someone who lives in New York. So this is something that, on one hand, is a very simple answer, and on one hand, is not the slightest bit simple. So. Um, for regular unemployment, so we're not talking about this PUA system, but regular unemployment, somebody can apply in any state that they have worked in in the last year, essentially. Um, if somebody has worked in three different states in the last year and has earned wages, W-2 wages and all of those, they can apply in any of the three. Um, it doesn't matter. It's usually if anybody asks you, they should look into who has the best benefits because that would be the better place to apply, which is generally Massachusetts. Um, I'm not sure that we have our best benefits on every single factor, but generally we have better than other, other places. But it gets kind of complicated if somebody's, you know, you, this question says, we, we, the employer is based in Massachusetts, but we hired someone based in New York. So if somebody is working, let's say remotely from New York into a Massachusetts company, they can certainly have an argument that that is Massachusetts employment, even if they are sitting in New York while doing it. But they also have an argument that that is a New York employment. So those are kind of a slightly fluid uh, there. Um, so they could probably apply in Massachusetts or New York. And if they worked earlier in Massachusetts, they could do that too. Awesome. Um, so here's a question that we've, we've got a lot and that, you know, something that we've even dealt with in our organization. I got a notification from the Department of Unemployment Assistance that an employee has filed a claim that employee still works for us and there's been no change in their hours. And, you know, I've spoken to them and they have no idea what this even is. Uh, what do I do? You call the Department of Massachusetts Department of Unemployment um, fraud hotline. And um, I imagine Sarah can get us that number in minutes. She's so good here. Uh, but if they have a hotline where you call and report that and said somebody appears to have filed a report in my employee's name and I just talked to my employee and they didn't. And that means either there's a glitch in the system or the, there are people out there fraudulently filing doing identity theft. You also want to go back and tell your employee that they may have had their data compromised somewhere else and have their, you know, somebody's out there with their social security number, basically. So they might want to do things like change their credit cards and things also. Mm -hmm. Are there, that's, that's the one that we've seen the most. And that's the one that we've, we've, you know, heard a lot of organizations just having this problem. It's been happening a lot. Yeah. Lots of people, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, just with, with PUA and just the, the surge and, and uh, need for unemployment assistance and the attention it's getting it, uh, of course. Um, have there been any, or are there any other type of unemployment, like, scams or other kinds of fraudulent activities that just employers should be on the lookout for. This is a kind of easy one because you can you can you know cross reference with the employee like did you file for unemployment? No, I didn't. Um, but are there other ones that might be you know either trickier to find or just you know other types that have been happening either lately or just generally? Of scams? Um no, not that I not that I know of. But, I mean people might also have the the PUA, the pandemic unemployment mm -hmm. assistance claims filed in their name. And even if they're a W-2 worker for you, they, they, some people are still stealing identities and doing that too. That may not come back to the employer. It may come back just to the employee, but it's something people don't just ignore it. Say, uh, you know, follow up on it because if it, you don't ever report that this wasn't you and they send that person $10,000 and then they find out they shouldn't have been getting it. It might be back on you, the employee, to, to do it if you, don't, you haven't reported that it wasn't you. That's, but no so, other, no other scams or anything now. Okay. And would it be the same process if, you know, let's say it was an employee who did just wrongfully file for unemployment, like uh, they do still work for us, their hours have not been reduced, their wages have not been reduced. Um, they're still, you know, everything is the same, but they did, you know, file an unemployment claim. 
maybe it's a big company and they think no one will notice or something like that. Would it be the same process? Like, do I have to, you know, still report that as fraud or is there something um, that I should be doing internally to deal with that? Well, I mean, it's always good to talk to people. I mean, you would find out that by getting this, this, you know, notification saying this person has applied, did they, did they work for you? Did they still, what was their last day? And if none of that, if they're still there, I want to find out what's going on. Just, I mean, you're not going to know if it's fraud, right? Unless you go and talk to them to see if it was somebody else filed in their name. But if they, I guess if they admit that they did that, then, um, you know, urge them to turn themselves in or, or, you know, you should, you should report it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have some questions just kind of generally related to personnel management. Um, so, you know, supposing we furloughed some of our employees, we're finally able to bring them back. They haven't received all of their unemployment benefits though. So they haven't received all of the weeks that they're entitled to. Um, will bringing them back prevent them from collecting unemployment again in the future if we have to suspend operations again, or even if they needed unemployment on, on different grounds? Um, like, you know, that they've been on unemployment, will that, you know, do they have like a maximum cap that they're entitled to forever? And once they've depleted that, it's done. Uh, uh, there is no maximum cap forever. In, in the old days, pre-pandemic, there's a maximum cap of 26 weeks per, per claim, um, which is kind of, well, I guess somebody could get laid off, work through their 26 weeks of unemployment, get another job, get laid off two months later, reapply and, and maybe have that start back up. But now all, all that's off because of the, the Congress keeps extending these extra weeks. So right now the extra weeks are extended through, mm -hmm. through August. I mean, when Biden signs this tomorrow. So there, the number of weeks keeps going up and up and the 26 is you know not the case now there's all these extra weeks being added on yeah so if somebody if you bring somebody back and they're like oh i could have had a few more weeks right now everybody can have more weeks because everybody almost can go be going through august so you bring them back now that you know you have to lay them off three months later you lay them off and they'll go back kind of where they were i mean it's possible that now they'll be closer to august well they would be closer to august um and maybe it's going to end then, so they didn't get as many weeks in that way. But they, of course, were working in between. So um, no, it doesn't hurt anything to bring people back, lay them off again, and they'll mm. start right back up. Okay, great. Um, so let's say I did. I, you know, we did terminate an employee. You know, it was for cause, um, or they did. They they voluntarily resigned from our organization. My understanding was that, you know, they're generally ineligible, ineligible for unemployment, but we've now since received an unemployment claim. Uh, what should I do? Like, is this improper or is there, is my understanding more limited than it, than it should be, you know, as an employer, um, you know, what, what do yes. I do in those instances? Um, your... Your understanding is limited. <laughs> so the the legal the legal definition those are two different things. If somebody's fired yeah. or they quit, two different things. But if they're terminated, fired, not not laid off, not furloughed. Um, the legal standard is is essentially whether they in, they were fired for engaging in deliberate misconduct. I don't know if anybody's ever done a study, but I think most people are terminated for not. That's not the reason. Mm -hmm. People are terminated because they, you know, weren't a good fit for the job because they weren't able to meet their quotas because they, they, um, you know, weren't, they were trying, but they just, you know, they weren't there and weren't doing well enough. They, you know, maybe even had some personal problems. They gave them attendance issues. All of those are not going to be deliberate misconduct. So they are, well, they're entitled to apply for unemployment anyway. And it's up to them to, you know, prove that it was not deliberate misconduct or a knowing violation of a rule um and so a lot of people are eligible when they are terminated and um i guess as an employer you can try to fight that and try to try to describe why it was deliberate misconduct um i encourage you not to do that because i think it's mean but that's because i represent employees on the quitting that's um there's two different standards for quitting either if somebody quits because of the legal term is for good cause attributable to the employer, 
which could be things like, you know, their hours got cut too far, they had a sexually harassing boss, they um, maybe were, it doesn't want to work in your field, but they were moved to the night shift because that was the only thing that was available and that's you know, not going to work for them, then that would be good cause to quit their jobs. And there's another thing that is a legal standard that is if they quit because of an illegal term is are, quit for urgent, compelling, or necessitous reasons, then they're also eligible. And that is a standard that has, doesn't have anything to do with the employer, it kind of has to do with what's going on in their own lives. And if that is the case, if they are found to have quit for urgent, compelling, necessitous reasons, the employer's unemployment insurance rates do not get dinged. You, your, your rates do not get up, give up. So if somebody who says, I can't come back because of COVID, I'm now, my mother is at a high risk, um, I'm seeing tons of these issues, you know, I, I, I can't come back and work in the front, you know, work in that situation. And so I'm going to have to quit because of that. That is because of their health issues, their, their mother's health issues, whatever it is. That's probably going to be found to be an urgent, compelling, necessitous reason, which means it's not the employer's fault, which means employer won't be dinged for that. So mm -hmm. if somebody wants to quit for those reasons, don't panic and, and appeal their decision because it very well may not be affecting you as an employer at all. And we got another question in the interim, which is, is related. If our organization is restructuring staff and either eliminating or combining positions, uh, are there legal consequences or considerations for that? So what, what should we be thinking about when doing that and what are the potential consequences? So are you, are you reading, Luke? Um, yeah. Restructuring staff or eliminating combined positions. Okay, so let me see. Let's say that you have currently six people or six people in a, just to make something up in this category and you really, for financial reasons or whatever, need to bring it down to four. Um, for unemployment purposes, the, the two that you are eliminating, you are laying them off. That's what that is. That's a layoff. Um, very straightforward for unemployment purpose. For legal purposes in general, you know, if you keep only the men and get rid of the women, you might be in trouble. Uh, if you keep only the young people and get rid of the older people, I mean, you're gonna, you know, if there's not, if they're doing it on a discriminatory basis, or you're keeping only the person who called OSHA last week to complain about your working conditions, then there are considerations that way. But otherwise, no, you can, you can shift things around however you want, and the people that you're letting go are being laid off in that situation. And I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, Jill, um, because it, it relates more to the, the unemployment um, contribution rate. But does, do you know if that's at all related to, you know, the, that rate is based upon the wages that you're paying and your, the wages that you're paying that your employees and, you know, to that end, like, let's say that I decide to eliminate a position because it's just more affordable for me to combine these a position with another one and I decide to give you know a pay raise that is not commensurate with the combining of the positions you know I'm paying still less than what both positions are really worth even for one person to do um would that affect like one would that affect me and and give rise to any legal risk generally um and second you know, would that affect my my uh, unemployment contribution? Um, again, as long as it's not discriminatory, I don't see that there's any you know legal risk or problem with that. I don't know much about the unemployment contributions, but I believe there's a cap on the on the salary, like it's a percentage of salary up to a certain amount mm -hmm. that's really pretty low. So if you say, oh, now we're gonna, well, obviously, if you go from two people at forty thousand each down to one person at fifty thousand you went from two people to one. So that's going to save you money on your unemployment, you know, insurance premiums yeah. too. You might have to pay more because that, for that one person that went from 40 to 50, but I don't think so. I think the cap is lower than that, but I'm not sure about that. Okay. And kind of to that point, um, another, another one of my questions was, um, so if we expect that we'll need to lay employees off in the future, um, just because we're, we're reaching the end of our, our runway and we need to make, a decision on that. Um, if we pay them a little bit more now before we terminate them, 
will that help them with their unemployment claim that they ultimately get? Like, will that bolster it at all? Or is that kind of, is that calculation already set in stone in virtue of, you know, whatever they might have earned previously? So the way it works is that when the person applies for unemployment, the unemployment office looks back at their wages over the past four full quarters mm -hmm. and chooses the two highest and then average those those. Mm -hmm. So let's say you laid somebody off tomorrow because we're you know, March 12th and the person goes and applies for unemployment next week. They're in the middle of March. We're almost at the end of the quarter right now. Their, their calendar quarter. So January mm -hmm. 1st to March 31st. So person applies right now, their last four full quarters are going to be the two all four quarters of 2000 or 2020, um, which means that improving their wages right now is not going to do anything. But if you laid them off on April 1st and they're going to apply on April 2nd, now you're into a new quarter. So one of the four quarters that is the look back period is now the quarter we're in right now, March 1st, to, or, or, sorry, January 1st to March 31st. So if you're at close to the end of a quarter, if you pump up their wages for that quarter, um, then that, that will help, assuming um, you know, that the other quarters were all the same going back, then that will, be, that will help into the calculation. It's, you, know, you take those two top quarters and that's 26 weeks, and you average it out to see you know, what's the average over those 26 weeks. So if you, one week you suddenly give somebody an extra 30%, it's probably gonna be so negligible not to notice. Um, it also, it depends on all of the wages. If they're working a second job, that's combined in there too. So it may not, it may not have a big gap, but if you thought, oh, for the last month, we'll really give you a whole bunch more to kind of do this. Make sure you're, you're doing it. You don't want to do it in, in, in beginning of April because that person wouldn't be able to apply till July in order to have that count because they're in the quarter. It's a little complicated, but it, once you stop and kind of map it out, it's actually pretty straightforward. So it can help, but depending on, you know, what the amount is and, and, you know, kind of when you did it, it might make a negligible difference. Yes. And this may be, this may be, um, maybe going here somewhere else, but I don't remember seeing it, but what, one thing you can do, well, I guess it doesn't matter if you have like, you know, we had an extra $4,000 we want to spend on this person. I guess it doesn't matter if you do it that way or not. You're still giving them the extra money, which they're going to appreciate. You also, if you, if you give people severance pay, so you say, okay, you know, we're going to give, pay you severance pay for the next three weeks, the next two months, whatever it is, as long as they are signing a release of claims, you know, saying they can't sue you, mm -hmm. um, they can collect the severance pay and unemployment simultaneously. And, but then again, again, if you had an extra $4,000 to give them, it doesn't matter if you gave them to before or after, it would still be going in their pocket. So it doesn't really change it. Okay. So this is another question that we get all the time. And I alluded to earlier, um, many of our workers are 1099 independent contractors. And we can obviously, we could, we could get into the question of, you know, are they even rightfully independent contractors, you know, are they more likely employees? Are we, can we switch them to W-2 so they can get unemployment? Will that even, will that help? Will that make a difference? Is there anything we can do? Um, and this is a question that we have received pretty frequently. Um, yes, you can switch them to W-2. Um, you can do that anytime. And if you think that's what they qualify for, you should do it. Um, will it help them get unemployment? Um, in order to be eligible at all for unemployment, a person, for regular unemployment, for regular unemployment, they look back at the past year, past four quarters, and they have to have earned, it was $5,100 mm -hmm. was the amount in W-2 earnings in that period. Um, I think it might've just gone up to 5,400 or maybe 5,500, but they have to do that. So if you give them, you suddenly, Make them a W two person for one week and then lay them off. It, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't matter if they never got those those earnings in. But again, remember that it's every every person has the unemployment office will look at the person's all of their jobs, 
Um, there's a common myth out there that you apply for unemployment based on, you know, on this job or based on getting let go for this job. Oh no, I didn't want to apply, you know, to uh, on that job over there. It's like, no, it's a, it, that's not how it works. You're unemployed, you apply for you. And then they look back at your past jobs. So you may have somebody as a 1099 that you pay them part-time, but they also have a, a, a day job where they're, you know, waiting tables and getting paid with the W-2. And so they're going to qualify for regular unemployment as long as they have that $5,500 in that. It doesn't um, matter what you're doing really in, for their unemployment because they would qualify based on those wages. But if you put, made them a W-2, then they would be combined with that and that would, it would help get those wages up because they don't, when they look back and figure out your two highest quarters for the person and average them, they do not count 1099 wages in that. Mm -hmm. So um, there are some people who really got kind of screwed to use a legal term in the, um, the PUA system who had a day job, let's say where they made $6,000 in the past year, so a W-2 wages, so they qualified for regular unemployment but they had 1099 or independent contract workers self-employment where they made 90,000. And because they qualified for regular employment, they got a regular employment based on this measly six grand. Could not include the 90 grand because that wasn't part of regular unemployment, but also could not do a PUA claim. If they hadn't had the six grand, they could have had a mm -hmm. PUA claim and used the 90 grand and got a lot more money. So it's, um, it's, a, it's straightforward, but a little complicated to kind of piece it out. Yeah. Um, so do we, those are the, a lot of the questions that I had. Do we have any more questions from folks in the audience or? Yeah, I'll come up with one. Someone just sent me a, a message earlier, um, as you all were talking about that, uh, they were running an organization and a part-time employee who was laid off from another job claimed unemployment, but this person who was running this organization received the charge from the Department of Unemployment. So in this case, um, the employee, part-time employee was still an employee of that organization. It was another job, but then this person had to, to do with a claim. Um, and it's not really a question. It's more of a, an example of something that, that has happened in practice. And I think a lot of folks um, are uh, don't know that that's part of it part of the unemployment that's process. That's exactly too. what I was just talking about. If somebody gets laid off from their other job and now they're, they may or may not qualify depending on how many hours they have left at your place and what the balance are, but they apply for unemployment, they're going to look back at all of their employers for the past year and send them these forms. It doesn't mean they're trying to pull a fast one on you. It doesn't mean they're doing anything illegal. I dealt with a lot of employers who thought that and really should have looked into it and really screwed with people's lives by fighting something that they had no business doing and um, really hurt people when it doesn't have anything to do with you. You just answer the questions. Yes, he works here and he still works here and here's how much he made in the last quarter and this are many hours, that's all. Yeah, and I think back to our original point, we were talking about self-insuring. Yeah, nonprofits can self-insure. Um, they don't pay, but then they have to pay all when it comes in because they're not covered in that. And I think we were talking to a lot of organizations at right after the pandemic and all of their revenue pretty much dried up. And then they were hit with this and they were, they were self-insured in that way. And so they were on the hook for all of that coming in because they didn't have coverage for that. Right, and that is... You know, when you when you choose along the way that you are not going to play insurance premiums, it's kind of like choosing not to have car insurance. I'm not going to pay for that every month, but if my car gets crashed, I have to pay 100% of it myself. That was the choice your organization made. <laughs> Unfortunately, you couldn't predict the pandemic, but um, it kind of backfired. And there's, that's it is what it is. Yeah. So I would say as folks are thinking of any uh, last questions that they may have for Luke and Jill, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll address those in just a moment. Um, but I also wanted to give a quick plug as you're thinking about that for the remainder of the legal sessions that we have in the Mass Cultural Council uh, a series of workshop. Luke, do you want to talk a little bit about what's coming up from, from your side? Yeah, so the, the next workshops that we're doing, next week we'll be doing um, kind of a more structural nonprofit organizational workshop on, you know, what are the things that you need to think about if you are thinking of um, 
either suspending or closing your organization. So what do you have to think about with respect to risk management, your outstanding obligations, um, you know, what assets you have, your obligations, you know, your outstanding obligations, including those to your staff and your employees, what do you need to do? Um, so that one's coming up, I believe next week, the following week, we will be doing a workshop on um, nonprofit mergers and absorptions. Um, you know, we're, we're going to talk briefly about mergers, but, you know, our experience has been more often it is, and similarly in the for-profit world, one organization absorbing, you know, a smaller organization. Um, and, you know, what is going to happen kind of to, you know, legally with, with the two business entities, you know, as personnel might be moving from one to the other, um, again, from a risk management and risk assessment perspective. Um, and then the final workshop, and I know it's, after we had two back-to-back -back, uh, human resources one, but the final workshop that we'll be doing um, in early May, I believe, is what to be thinking about with respect to um, remote work. Because originally, you know, we were, at first we thought, you know, is there a concern that by then we're kind of gonna be back to normal, especially now with the, the kind of accelerated vaccination schedule. But I think the reality is that a lot of business organizations are, are a lot of the the things that we've learned from working remotely now are going to stay. Like I, I think there's a, a lot of us are probably going to be part time uh, work from home at least going forward. So we're going to be talking about you know from a more nuts and bolts perspective. You know what what policies should you be thinking about in your employee handbook? Um, what are your basic obligations? How do you and what you know what do you have to be thinking about with respect to um, wage and, and hour obligations and um, you know, managing remote staff and also, you know, data privacy, security, you know, with people, are you bringing your own device? Are you bringing a work device? You know, are you doing sensitive work on your personal device, et cetera? So we're going to be talking about that. Danielle Letterman's going to be back for that one. Um, and that will be fun. Um, but yeah, those are what we have up a couple of organizational ones, structural ones. And, um, then we'll be wrapping up our legal series with, um, um, uh, work from home. Great. And um, Sarah, just put all of those links in the chat. So if you want to go ahead and register for some of them, feel free to go ahead and do that uh, at any point. Um, Luke and Jill, we do have one last question that we received here before we close out with some resources. And I'll just read it. Um, and this is, comes in uh, anonymously. We laid off an employee due to lack of work, but then the position she was in changed and she did not want that job. As a courtesy, I offered her a contract job with us that is truly a contract with spare hours and different duties. Does her unemployment from being laid off from the first job relate in any way to us hiring her back as a contractor? So there's actually three pieces going on in there and I'm gonna break it apart. So if you had just laid her off and, that, and there wasn't the deal with the job changing, being changed back. If you just laid her off and then later, oh, we found some money, we're gonna hire you back as a contractor for our, um, sparse hours. That will not affect her unemployment uh, at all. She will report to the employment office that she got hired back with a little bit of money. She will need to report those wages every week on her unemployment claim, which may reduce her benefits a little bit depending on you know how low they are, even if it's 1099 where she needs to report them. Um, what could be problematic is the kind of the first two pieces. If you laid her off and then you changed the job and then offered to hire her back at the new job, nothing to do with the contractor piece. If, you know, if she said she didn't want it and, and that made sense to you and then she's fine. But if you, if you go and report to the unemployment office that you, uh, you tried to hire her back and she didn't want you, she turned you down, that could get her in, in trouble. So she, well, she would have to prove that the job was unsuitable when it was changed, not just like, oh, I didn't like it a little bit. Um, but it would only come up basically if one of the two of you went out of your way to report that to the unemployment office that uh, she was offered um, a job to come back and she didn't like the changes and refused it but it's not connected at all to the separate idea of bringing her back as a contractor. Those are kind of two different things. Great, thank you, Jill. And that was, that was an issue that we had, we had dealt with in the past too. We, we had a, a, 
a client who had been in kind of a similar circumstance. It wasn't, it wasn't a transition from, um, employer or employee to independent contractor, but it was, you know, in light of the pandemic, you know, the job that I was doing before, um, change the the needs were different um so we you know they basically offered that they changed the kind of the scope of my employment and i think there was a question of well is the work i'm doing now you know is it unsuitable um and i i think that was kind of an outstanding question but um that was something that kind of played into you know do do i need to leave this position or if i do that is it going to jeopardize my um ability to collect unemployment because they've, they've changed my position. It's not something that I, it's not something I was hired to do it was outside of my original scope of work, not necessarily a job that I can't do or that I'm incapable of doing, but it's not the job I was, you know, retained to do. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm now I'm between a rock and a hard place. What do I do? Um, so we we've, yeah, we've seen kind of similar circumstances like this too. And, and that's, it's a, you know, it's a matter of gradations. You know, if the job is unsuitable, the person has a right to refuse it, to turn it down. But what is suitable and what's not is very much open to discussion. And it comes down to how well you can present how unsuitable it was. And there are some guidelines in terms of change of hours and pay and times of the day, and particularly going from professional to non-professional. You know, you were a accountant and now they want you to sweep the floors usually works but there's most things fall into a lot more gray area there and essentially if i was talking to an employee i said you don't you're gonna have to sell it to the unemployment office that this was unsuitable and it made no sense for you to stay and if they were in your shoes they would do it too and that is all gradation areas not not um it's all how you present your story have them call yeah. me okay I, I, I can help <laughs> I want to I want to go back to that last anonymous thing and just make me think back to the contractor thing. I mean, I don't know what this person's hired to do and that it's a contractor job may or may not make sense with the law. But just because somebody's a sparse hours doesn't mean they have to be a contractor. You know, someone can be on payroll getting a W-2 and work two hours every other month. Um, that doesn't it's not the the sparseness of an hour has nothing to do with whether somebody's a contractor or not, by the way. So. Any other questions? I think we've cleared them all out. Thank cool. you to the both of you. Awesome. Um, well, I shared, I did share um, in the last slide, the couple of the you know common helpful resources for employers thinking about and, and having to manage unemployment issues. Um, the first one is the link just to the DUA's entire suite of resources and, and information and guides for employers. Um, the second is their specific guide for unemployment contributions. How do we calculate it? Where do you find the reference to the actual Massachusetts law that you know, determines what that calculation is? When do I have to pay? How can I pay? Everything you need to know about making those payments. Again, if you're working with a regular payroll processor, they'll manage it um, and, and you won't have to worry about it. And then the last one is the the online registration portal for employers to register for um, as an employer with the Department of Unemployment Assistance so that you can um, prepare your, your regular contributions if you're not working with a payroll processor or if you're relatively new and you you um, you now have staff and, and you're paying them such that it meets the requirement. Um, it's it's interesting because we, th we think of, you know, we think of unemployment as taking effect kind of when a relationship ends, but it's something that you need to be thinking about even, you know, when you're beginning, like, um, cause we work with a lot of nonprofit organizations that are growing and they're bringing on staff. And this is another, you know, another, you know, part of your suite of obligations to your employees that you need to be thinking about, even as you're an emerging and, and starting business. Um, so that's that, that reference there. And then we are still providing, um, legal services, and we're still providing um, waivers for our applications, uh, our, our lawyer referral service and our application fees for any person or organization who is suffering from COVID either physically or economically. Um, and the instructions on, on how to apply for legal services through the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts is right here. Um, we updated our website last month, I think, so now you can do it online. Um, 
So if you do have any questions, more specific questions about anything that Jill talked about or that I talked about, um, and you want to talk to a labor and employment attorney, um, be it your employer or an employee, then please contact us. We, we are here to help. And we understand that sometimes these presentations do raise more questions and we do invite that. We know that that's, that's, that's the point is to get you to start thinking about these, these issues. I have one more, one more uh, thought. The, the pandemic unemployment assistant, which is normally for, again, we talked about for the gig, gig workers self-employed and somebody again, might be a gig worker for you, might be a contractor and have another W-2 job that is enough money so they wouldn't qualify. But assuming somebody is, they have a series of, you know, musician, a series of jobs, it's all contract work. They, you know, the PUA system is still going on. That does not affect your rates as an employer. Um, they can still apply if they if they lose their job, but with the PUA, it has to be they have to be out of work because of COVID. So um, if you are laying somebody off who is a contractor, you know, ending the contract, you will help them out. It's not going to hurt you because again, you're not paying into the system. If you write a a you know a layoff letter that says we're ending your work because of COVID needs it mm -hmm. because of COVID has forced the business to do it that will greatly help their ability to get onto the POA system. That's a really great point. Thank you for sharing that, Jill. All right. Well, thank you, Luke and Jill, for for giving us your time today, and thank you for everyone for coming. Um, I just want to say that um, uh, this type of uh, detailed information is really, really important. Sometimes we look at some of the larger challenges because of COVID, you know, the virtual programming or fundraising or some of the other things that uh, have challenged us and some of the stuff um, uh, is ignored or it's too late to do anything about. So we do appreciate you giving us uh, your time today. As I mentioned, for everyone else here, um, we will be sharing the materials. Thank you to Sarah for putting a lot of the links down, the chat has been active with links and resources. So we thank you for that. Uh, and then we look forward to seeing you at our next workshop. Um, uh, you've got all the links of all of that there. And we'll see you, Luke. We'll see you back at a couple other ones. And Jill, thanks for being our guest today. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Stay safe.